But welcome everybody uh, to the third video on our Peer Stories installment of, uh, with Spinal Cord Engine Alberta. Uh, we have been doing these videos to share the stories of the amazing people in our communities uh, with their experiences when they went through some of the hardest parts and the darkest parts of their lives. Um, I am pleased to be joined by Crystal Men, who has been injured for 29 years coming up on her birthday here. And uh, she's going to share a little bit about her, her story and her experiences, and hopefully it can uh, reach some of the people out there that need this help. So thank you again so much, Crystal, for coming. And you know what, let's just get right into it and start off with, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself before your injury. I was 25, and I've always been a very busy person. I had two different jobs. I worked at one bar as a bartender and another lounge as a cocktail waitress. Plus, I was going to school to be a travel agent. So I was always very busy. Um, well, then let's get into the hard part. How did your injury happen? <laughs> what were your experiences like? Uh, going through that initial hospital and rehabilitation. I was driving from Edmonton to Rocky Mountain House to visit my mom. And I was about halfway there when I started to play with my radio station. And when I looked up, I was half in the ditch. And I tried to correct it. But before I could, my car ended up flipping end over end and flew 50 feet and landed on the roof. And then it slid another 20 in the ditch. And because it was March, there was still a lot of snow. And so as my car was sliding in the ditch, it filled my car with snow. And I wasn't able to move the snow away from my face because the car was pretty much on top of me. And I was starting to suffocate. Luckily, some people stopped right away and I was able to get them to move the snow away from my face so I could breathe. It was it was really horrifying, actually. Oh, it didn't take long for help. Yeah, it didn't take long for help to come, but it took them three hours to cut me out of the car because the roof was completely flattened. And once they got me out, I was flown by Stars Air Ambulance. So I have to give a shout out to them. If it wasn't for Stars, I wouldn't have made it. So I always make sure that I buy their calendars and uh, buy their lottery tickets. <laughs> no luck yet though. It was, it's still kind of like when I talk about it, I still kind of get that tight feeling in my chest. It's, uh, yeah. It was quite horrifying being trapped in the car and not knowing if I was going to live or die. So they flew me to the U of A hospital and I woke up three days later and found out that I'd broken my neck at the C6 level. And of course, at that time, it didn't mean a whole lot because I wasn't really sure what a spinal cord injury was. <sighs> You're doing great. Yeah. I was at the U of A for a week before I was sent to the Glen Rose. And being at the Glen Rose was an incredible experience. The staff were just wonderful and supportive and encouraging. It was just a, a really good place to land and learn about my new life. Because I was so close to dying in my car accident, when I woke up in the hospital, I was so happy to still be alive that the spinal cord injury didn't really impact me a whole lot because I was just so grateful to still be around. And that really carried through my whole time at the Glen Rose. I was there for um, almost eight months which was like missing out on three seasons. It was a long time. That, that's something that uh, you raise a real good 
point is most spinal cord injuries coincide with a traumatic experience. It's not just the physical injury that you experience, but it's just the fact that you're still alive after something like that. And you have to process that and it takes so much time. And that's, thank you so much for sharing that. It's, I couldn't even imagine I had a doggy pile on my head a block away from the hospital. So I have, I, I, I was blessed and lucky to be in that situation. And I couldn't imagine what you had to go through. So thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, for listening oh no problem um so you had that experience of the glamorous what were some of the hardest things you've already kind of talked a little bit about having the process just being alive what were some of the hardest things that you experienced as you uh transitioned from the rehabilitation back to your home what you know what were some of the things like you knew that you were going to experience before you transitioned and had to experience after in the hospital for so long that I actually didn't want to leave I was so comfortable and it felt like home and the idea of going home was really scary for me so I struggled quite a bit with the transition to home it was weird going from a situation where everybody was used to seeing people in wheelchairs to then transitioning to home and going out in public where I attracted a lot of attention. It just felt like I was being scrutinized and was always being stared at and had strangers come up and ask me what was wrong with me or asking if they could pray over me. I just, I had a lot of uncomfortable experiences out in public. And it really caused me a lot of anxiety. And it got to the point where I just actually couldn't even leave my house. And I even had trouble answering the phone because my anxiety was so prevalent. And I've always said that my anxiety crippled me more than my wheelchair ever could. Like, and then after about a year of living in acute anxiety, I finally made an appointment to see my doctor. And he got me on some medication to help with the anxiety. And then I just slowly started going out in public and getting comfortable again. I started volunteering and that made it better. And with each step, I just got healthier and healthier. So, yeah no that I'm, I'm really loving the points you're bringing up you know it's it's known as a physical disability but there's so many mental hurdles to overcome uh right off the bat and throughout your entire life every time you transition and I I had the same feeling of as soon as I got out of the hospital it wasn't physically that I couldn't get out of the house. I just didn't like my own perception of what people, I thought people saw when they saw me and, or people coming up and trying to offer me things I didn't need or want. <laughs> and it's just, it's something that you kind of have to get used to, unfortunately, but also there's also some amazing people out there and it kind of you know, you kind of get a little bit of everything when you get out. And I'm just glad that you were able to get over, overcome that. Um, if you could do your injury, your rehabilitation and your transition home again, would you do anything differently? And also, what questions would you have asked? Differently, I would have pursued treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I think that would have been really key in helping me do that transition. And um, because of my schooling, I eventually did have to work on all of my traumatic issues from the past in order to do the line of work that I wanted to do. So I eventually addressed the PTSD, and uh, but I would have pursued it a lot earlier. Mm -hmm. And what was the question? Uh, the second part was uh, like, what well, what questions did you would you wish you had asked while you were in rehabilitation? Things that you might not have known 
at the time um, at, and then you wish you had asked later. Uh, gotten more information on um, on the ability to go back to school or uh, get some information on work or how to get scholarships for schooling. Um, but at the time, I think you're just so focused on survival that you don't mm -hmm. or I didn't really think too much uh, ahead. But yeah. if I could do it over again, I would have uh, asked a little bit more about going back to school and whether or not that was even a possibility. Because at the time of my injury, um, I just didn't think about what was possible. Yeah, uh, I definitely relate to that. Everybody wants to get out as fast as possible sometimes. Like you said, it was like home to you, but sometimes it's just, you just want to do you know get out or get get be able again you know you're not thinking about the next step the next thing especially depending on what age you are um and you being at an age where it's you know this was a transition in your life at your age not just your injury right yeah um well last question and this is what i'm excited to hear is what does life look like for you now? It's been 29 years and you still look like you're kicking it. So how's it going? Really well, I, uh, I lead a pretty quiet life. I do my volunteer work. I volunteer at the Glenrose Hospital as a peer uh, mentor. And I help teach education classes for individuals with newer spinal cord injuries. So we do uh, classes on issues with bowel and bladder and pressure sores. And um, yeah, so I volunteer. I have a 27 year old son. So I, uh, I lead a pretty, pretty good life, I would say. I had to medically retire from my job though. And that was another transition that was kind of hard because I really loved my job, but I'd had a really bad fall when I broke both my femurs. And yeah, it was a pretty bad injury. And I just never regained my mobility again. And so I wasn't able to be in my chair for really long periods of time. I had to kind of build that back up. So unfortunately I had to medically retire, but I, would say that I live a nice quiet life that's great it's it's great to be hear the stories of those people that have gone through what you've gone through especially and be able to be where you are and you say I'm good <laughs> life's life's going on and it's okay um I realized that I did skip one question and I would like to ask what's your most valuable piece of advice you've ever received or, or multiple pieces of advice that really helped you along your, along your journey? I would say that I have a couple. Um, the first one was, uh, was from my father. When I was growing up, he was a heroin addict and in and out of prison. So I didn't really have a relationship with him. But over the course of my car accident, we reconnected. And he had been clean and sober for 10 years and was working as an addictions counselor. And he taught me the serenity prayer, which is really short. It's just God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And I just found those words really helpful. And I taped them on my fridge. I had them up in the walls, kept it in my bedroom. And so I found that serenity prayer really helped me put things into perspective. And the second thing would be learning about mindfulness. I learned about that in university. One of my professors did a lab on it and I participated in it. And it really helped to keep me grounded and not thinking about the past or worrying about the future. It just helps you to focus on today. 
And so those are probably the two biggest um, teachings that I received. Oh, and I'm glad I missed that question because that is a great way to end this peer stories. Those are awesome pieces of advice. I think there's, it's really hard, especially early on to accept things. And I think most of the people that you know, and I know that have ex excelled in this injury and have moved on, have figured out how to, and now control the things they can control. And it's, uh, it's not an easy life, but a lot of us are making it look easy. And you talking to me here are one of them. Thank you so much, Crystal, for coming in and being a part of this series. And I really hope that a lot of people watching this video get something out of it to uh, help them on their journey. Yeah, me too. Thank you so much for including me. I really appreciate it.